Uh, you guys are comfortable in the back row? I can hear you. Okay, as long as you can hear me, that's guess is it's all. I don't have to be seen, that's right. Just heard, right? Okay. <laughs> First Corinthians. By the time Paul left Corinth for Ephesus, the church had matured theologically, but it was anything but holy. It seems there were a multitude of unconfessed sins being ignored among them, and Paul was confronting their carnality issue by issue. And so of late, we've been talking to the issues of chapters 8 and 9, which showed unrestrained sin practiced as a Christian liberty. You have to really think about that. Too often that's what happens in Christian life. We claim our liberty, but we are practicing a sin, and that liberty does not allow that. So, first, to offend a fellow believer's conscience over food collected from pagan altars that we read about in chapter 8, uh, thereby introducing us to the need of a cleansed conscience empowered by the Holy Spirit, which Hebrews 9 speaks to. The Holy Spirit is the one who cleanses the conscience, not our brothers and sisters. But it also informs us that uh, under the prerogative of the Holy Spirit, Paul could speak to those who would be weak in conscience and those who would be strong, as we saw in, in chapter 8, verses 7 and 10. Then when we began in chapter 9, Paul, with multiple rhetorical questions, makes the reader conclude that a critical spirit was judging him from within the church itself. It is evident that God had prepared him for the slander to be waged against his character. How else would he have known not to take a wage for services rendered? And I just ask you that because I think it's provoked by the study. But from the, out of the cultural standards, they would claim his humble lifestyle made him unfit. For example, a celibate lifestyle diminished in their eyes a right to apostleship. Manual labor as a tent maker affronted Jewish legalism, made him also look like a low caste servant among Romans. When presenting the gospel and God's truth, he was accused by the Greeks of, in his own words, being unskilled of speech. We read that in the second Corinthians. But when he denied wages from the Corinthian church, but accepted material support from the Macedonian churches that we read about in 2 Corinthians 11, and backed his right to this Christian liberty with Old Testament law, he made visible their hidden motives. I think we should really ponder how the Spirit led him to refuse wages for service. It wasn't that he had before. That was not an issue apparently in the other churches. But God knew what the heart of these people was. He and probably, so I'll put it this way. He probably struggled with that because he was living rather meagerly lifestyle and he it's probably a temptation to but he still refused. He, uh, he obviously refused it. Yeah. He knew that if he accepted wages for ministry from the Corinthians, they could use it as 
a limit to his Christian liberty by making him a hireling. He made it plain in the last week's lesson from verses 12 to 18 of chapter 9 that his desire as Christ's bondservant was to never be encumbered by any mercenary thought when selling spiritual truth. Now, why do I use that word selling? If you look at verse 18, which reads this way, what then is my reward that when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel? Paul was given it to all humanity, the gospel message to all humanity, which at that point was the locus of 1 Corinthians in the city of Corinth. And he made it as an offer. The Greek word for offer is a familiar word to us, tithemi, a tithe. As it were a tithe without charge, he says. I sold it as a tithe without charge. You ever think about that? Becoming a fellow partaker of it, he says in verse 23. That made me a fellow partaker in that which I was selling. Never preaching something he wasn't, especially as being saved by God's grace. That's where the emphasis was when he came to Corinth. So when he came to Corinth, he came meek and lowly. He wasn't riding on a colt. But he was the bondservant of Jesus. He was humble. And that culture didn't tolerate that. What did they want him to be? Well, you see, the flip side is if he had been a strong orator, he would have, what, discredited the message. Because it isn't the message that the orators were giving out. It had nothing to do with spin. I mean, the Greek orator philosophers were spinning. The word we use for spin means slanted information, which previously in my younger generation was called propaganda. They didn't care what the content of the message was. They were just enamored with how well he did it. So as we would say in the vernacular, he was damned if he did it, he was damned if he didn't. And you follow? And so God put him into this narrow box as a showcase if you please, of what a man with a clean conscience following Christian liberty is like. And he stepped on that in verse 13 in chapter 8. And he'll step on it heavier later in this chapter. And so as today's lesson unfolds, we start with verse 23, which I just alluded to. And verse 23 said, And I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become as a fellow partaker of it. The power of the gospel to save is also the power needed to sanctify. That's the message here. We have to agree to that. Unfortunately, the Christian church likes to stop with the power to save. It's not too interested in the power to sanctify. I'll do it my way. And what do you have when you have a congregation of people who have that attitude? Immediate grounds for trouble. And it usually comes first toward the pastor. He may not have committed any unrighteous act. I just don't like his character. Whatever. We've all visited it. We've all seen it. 
The glory of God is revealed to those who share in it. Paul, as God's fellow worker, reaped the joy of harvest with those saved that had been saved by the gospel that he had preached. And practicing the sanctified life of God's new creation in him, he was revealed to them both in action and speech. They didn't buy it. But they had to buy it because it isn't long until he proves to them that they have to. Wake up, Christians. And that's what the lesson will continue to develop for us as we get into chapter 10 today. But before we get there, take a quick look with me about this sanctified walk because he gets, he just touches on it in verses 25 and 26 and 26 and 27. And he says it this way. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? And then he says, run in such a way that you may win. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Then they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. Huh? So looking at this, Paul uses a well-known metaphor of the Greek athletic competitions. There were two of them, the Corinthian Games and the Olympic Games. They were well familiar with it. That was their blood sport, if you want to call it that. That was their football game. It was track and field. It was running primarily. And the Greeks were good at it. You remember the Greek runner that ran the information that brought down the uh, Far Eastern Empire when they attacked Greece? Yeah. It happened. Big time. And it was all because a man ran a marathon. How do you run a marathon like he ran a marathon? Not unless you had as a society already built the idea, just like the Kenyans have built in our day, that we're runners and we'll outrun anybody on the face of the earth. So using that metaphor, to embrace understanding of Christian sanctification, he's liking sanctification and the race that is there found within to those races. The metaphor is not to see if one Christian can best another. That's not the issue here. It is rather exercising personal liberty under self-control. You notice the word self-control? Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They prepared for that race. Lots of preparation. So he's talking about the personal liberty of the Christian under self-control to, to overcome obstacles that would diminish the high calling of Christ. He doesn't want anybody running out of their lane. You don't break the rules. And thus, if they and thus they would be qualified for the awaiting crown given to the faithful who run a righteous race. Not that you beat your fellow brother and sister. That's not the issue. The issue is, did you all run in the right lane? And did you strive under self-control and the best you could give to your master to achieve that gift? At the end, the imperishable gift, the reward of the Bema Seat? Run to win. The Greek means to secure in the language of interpretation. Run to secure it. In context, holding fast to Christian liberties as selfish rights is a way to lose 
the spiritual race. There are, there are governors given to the conscience, to the clean conscience, by the Holy Spirit that restrain how liberty is pursued. We visited that back concerning the meats that came off of the idols. It'll be visited again as we study. To run humbly will erase a prideful start and be rewarded with an imperishable crown. Philippians 3 talks to that. Then there's another half to look at. Paul is getting pretty personal when he gets to the last half of verse 26 and 27. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. It's almost those words without aim or a hyphen. Because what does he introduce us to? I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Boy, that's a mouthful. He was running life's race with his eyes on the goal of winning the imperishable prize. That could only be done as a faithful bondservant. But Paul, using the metaphor of a boxer, knew he was not shadow boxing. He was engaging a war against his own flesh. He's already talked about that in our previous study in Romans 7 and 8. You remember back then when he said, everything I do fails until the Holy Spirit guides me? As he switched from chapter 8 to chapter 9, chapter 7 to chapter 8 in Romans. That same message is coming through here. I'm sorry, the right side of my nose just wants to run. He expressed that a battle to overcome the flesh by buffeting, and the Greek word says literally to us, to strike oneself under the eye to make it felt and visible. By buffeting my body, soma, same word used for flesh. He would therefore make it my slave. I'm the slave of my Christ, my master. I'm going to make my own body a slave of me. I am a renewed man. I'm going to make my flesh. under the control of my own buffeting of it, my slave. Do you see the cascade of slavery? I think those are marvelous verses. Interesting to see how he finishes the last two chapters. But he isn't finished. He's gonna give us more here in just a, a minute. Thus he's avoiding hypocrisy when preaching to others, and others here is of the same kind, speaking of Christian brothers and sisters. Should he not box diligently, fleshly sin might disqualify his message. He was well aware of that. And since the weapons of his warfare are not carnal, Paul called on the Holy Spirit as chief strategist in this battle not only in his race, but also in his buffeting of his own flesh. And it makes me think of Romans 8 and, it, and these words from verse 12 to 14. <clears throat> so then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Interpreted, in my thinking, 
that imputed righteousness, which we call sanctified living, when it is, a, when it is practiced by the power of the Spirit, was indeed his desire and his desire for us. I don't know whether chapters 8 and 9 captured much of your attention, but there's a lot here to capture. Seems pretty straightforward to read it, but it doesn't give you the depth of what's really going on. Unless you understand some of the Greek, unless you understand some of the context, unless you really look at words like titheme. And understand what that's saying to us. In chapter 10, this is another look at that liberty issue. The whole subject over the last three weeks has been liberty and conscience. And we're still there. A look at liberty and a Christian's higher obligation to be led by the Spirit, which we just read about in Romans 8. Paul uses the historical record of his Israel by enumerating their five advantages. They're given five advantages in the first four verses, which they, in their time of liberty, abused and thereby displeased God, as verse 5 comments. He wants the church to look at the fleshly craving of Israel as an example of how easy it is to corrupt Christian liberty. He's going to use that on the one hand, on the other hand, type of argument. Christian liberty does not set one free from testing also, because verse 13 is going to be introduced into this subject. And 2 Corinthians tells us it is the law of faith, recorded in Romans 3.27, that replaces pride with humility, that makes liberty right with God. Humility makes our liberty right with God. Paul voices concern that the church would ever allow sharing God with devotion to idols, and he'll spend time from verses 14 through 22 upon that. Lastly, we visit the sanctified life that demands we reveal God's glory. Again, the imputed righteousness is led by the Spirit to practice it without offense to the Jew or the Gentile or the church. And he goes through that whole section of verse 23 to 33 to explain that. So starting in the first four verses, let's read the first two together here and, and then comment on them. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. We'll read the verses 3 and 4 in a minute, but let's start here. He's building... Paul is building a case on how to practice Christian liberty by examining Israel's liberty. They're not equal in terms of empowerment. Um, speak to it this way. It is very inclusive, using the word all. You'll notice that five times he uses the word all. Very inclusive to all the people Israel was blessed with God's grace being released from Egyptian bondage to the slavery of their physical being. Also, as it were, to their religious being. Because they were oppressed by the godless gods of Pharaoh's culture. So they're being released both physically and spiritually to some degree. And they experienced the Red Sea baptism. They were nourished by manna. And they had a plenteous water supply. 
from the rock. All of it was a physical redemption at first glance. Now, the church's liberty is obtained with a redemption from sin unto a baptism in Christ and being nourished and watered by the Holy Spirit. There is a parallelism there. National Israel had received these five blessings. All passed through. And this speaks to a voluntary choice. It's indicated by the middle voice in this verb. All passed through. They chose to follow. And they were protected by the cloud. They passed through the sea and protected by the cloud. They became spiritually disqualified in their passage, which was also their choice when they worshiped the golden calf at Sinai and grumbled at God. And we know by history recorded in scripture, only two of the generation were promoted. That's a small remnant of probably three million people. Of a small remnant. That sounds like Noah's day. Their personal sinful character was made evident by a faithless choice. A choice to not obey God that was given to them through Moses' teaching. So it speaks to they were baptized into Moses through the cloud and the sea. That was their standard of leadership. That was their teaching from God himself through Moses. Flawed? Yeah, Moses was flawed. We know that. He didn't get into the land either. But God spoke to them through Moses, and Moses led them appropriate to God's calling. But how much liberty did they have when they left Egypt? They had some liberty of choice to follow. They found that liberty pretty shallow when it didn't meet their standards. Right? They get disqualified pretty fast. They were quick to try to disqualify themselves and separate themselves, both from Moses and God. In verse 2, the cloud was the signature sign of God leading the people by this, by God's chosen servant Moses, it reflects forward to Messiah's day where a faithful believer is baptized into the body of Christ and led by his spirit. The parallel continues. Verse three and four, it steps up the issue a little. It says that all ate the same spiritual food. All of a sudden we're switching from physical to spiritual. Yeah, it was physical food, but that's not the issue. The issue is to teach the Corinthian church that there's a spiritual food involved in your eating from the meats coming off of the idol. Your conscience is dealing with that on unequal basis, and you're offending one. We've been through that, so we'll not repeat it. So as we read, and all drank of the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. You see how it switched? We get caught up in the physical redemption, only to find out that you can't leave it there because the liberty gets into the spiritual definitions of immorality. And so we're now speaking to the spiritual as we look at these two verses. It is the spiritual atmosphere that was provided by manna from heaven and water from a rock that fed and nourished more than just the physical body. 
it in some ways is likened them to what we uh, speak to when we talk about the universal call of Romans 1 and the calling of the communion table. It's all in that same category that we look at this. The source is Christ. Here, God's intent was to awaken individual hearts to Christ, being the bread of life and the living water. Mana and the water from the rock. Indeed, by spiritualizing the rock as the Messiah, because it speaks to the, that issue, we see him struck. Christ struck. The rock struck. Christ the rock struck for their sakes in the time of their affliction. And you can read about it back in Deuteronomy 8. It is far from a magical protection. When the church ordinances of water baptism and the Lord's Supper are celebrated, you've got to get away from any thought of that takes a renewed mind to understand the practice of sanctification through the ordinances of baptism and, and the Lord's Supper. The Catholics inflated it, did they not? They made the Lord's Supper the elements that you took as his real body and his real blood. And we're saying, no, they're symbols. Verse 5 speaks to all four of these verses. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Fact, for sure. So the result of their liberty Most of them was not well pleased. It's reflected, it reflected in the historical thought of Hebrews 3. I'm going to touch there a couple of times this morning, and this is one of them. In Hebrews 3, 15 to 19, we read these words. See if it echoes. While it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, speaking to the time in the wilderness. I'll tell you, this nose is a faucet. It started at 2 o'clock this morning. I was totally well when I went to bed. I'd just come off of COVID. And all of a sudden, the right nostril decides it's going to be a faucet. Now, help me understand that. The left side doesn't even answer to it. <laughs> it isn't a parallelism like unto what we're studying. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> now where was I shame on me <clears throat> Hebrews 3 15 for who provoked him that's God when they had heard indeed did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses and with whom was he angry for 40 years was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Pretty well said. They provoked his love and received his wrath. Psalms 95 put it this way, For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who err in their heart and they do not know my ways. Now I excuse them because I understand and I do this because I'm human. They didn't have the Holy Spirit to lead them. They made their choices out of secular thought. They had enough biblical truth to know better. There was a conscience there. They wouldn't have bad. 
So how bad can a conscience get? Scripture says it gets hard. Like those words we just read talked about the hardened hearts in verse 15 of chapter 3 of Hebrews. Verse 6. No, I'm not quite there. Just before I get to verse 6. Their, free, their freedom was not appreciated by themselves. Do we appreciate our freedom? Absolutely do not. My circumstances are so bad. Why isn't God good to me all the time? You hear that message everywhere you go. They wanted freedom from trials. And they despised their circumstances. That's the only summary I can make and think that it speaks to the truth that I'm reading. So they rebelled against their Redeemer and chose unprofitable, sinful lifestyles. Being disqualified, their corpses were strewn in the wilderness. Verse 6. Now these things happened as an example for us that we should not crave evil things as they also craved. Now these things refers back to God's actions and Israel's unrighteous response that we just studied. These are lessons to be learned from history and the Corinthian church also lacked discipline and was self-indulgent. Paul had written about Christian liberty clear back 10 years before in Galatians 5, and he saw in Corinth a repeat proclivity to carnal living, as did the first generation of Israel, a parallel transgression, if you please, made evident by what? A craving. The word craving means to lust after, of evil meaning bad things, a craving after bad things. The proclivity of the sinful nature of man is to crave for bad things. Uh, don't see them as bad to begin with, you see them as pleasure. Often the case. But there's a deep craving and, and the, this church had a craving so in verse 7, he starts with five examples, just like there were before when he spoke to five concerning all of them inclusively. He begins to say, and do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play, and it's quoting from Exodus 32. So, idolatry, was it in the Corinthian church? Or had they all been called out from it and forgotten it? Or did they bring it in a little bit synchristically? I suspect we have to say the latter. It was more than just eating meat obtained from pagan sacrifice, but was promoted and morphed, as we saw, will see historically if you study church history, into worship of icons, angels, even Mariology, and other selected church saints it blossomed. Uh, was the only was Corinth the only church that this happened in? No. But to the issue of the study, it is Corinth here. 
So the Corinthian church had been called out from idolatrous religion. MacArthur said, any concept of God that is not biblical is false. And if believed and followed, it becomes an idol. What's the idolatry of our society? Oh, I can worship God on the mountain. I don't have to go down to that church. Is that one of them? You can just talk about a multitude of things. Uh, football on Sunday can become an idol. We also have to understand that throughout history in the study of idolatry, it leads and is often connected to immorality. And so bringing holy worship before unholy altars leads to, as the Exodus 32 said centuries ago, to play. The word play is interpreted rightly from the Greek as sexual play. What went on in the idolatrous worship of the ancient societies, the great kingdoms? Always tied up with Ishtar. Always tied up with trying to bring forth produce in the land by what? Sexual activity on high stages in front of all the people. Idolatrous pagan worship leads to play. And out of the ones in the day in which this was written, they would get up from their quotes worship at the idols and they went out to play. Verse 8. That sounds so repulsive when we talk about it in, in ancient history, but look at our what our that's right. All you have to do is slip on the TV and what's standing there? Play. Yeah. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Verse 8. Sexual immorality was a problem in the Corinthian church as we go back to chapter 5 and verse 1. Outside of the context of just speaking to idolatry, even. Uh, after all, their whole culture had been immersed in it. Paul reminds each person, it's in, because it's in the verb tense, it's very personal, they must flee it. The stark remained, the reminder is that God's judgment of Israelites that cohabited with the daughters of Moab. You remember the daughters of Moab? Where were the Israelites at that point? Poised to enter the land of Canaan. How did they get to Moab? Now, do you understand? You call it Moab. But the word, I think, is more linguistically right, Moab. They had to go up and over and down to get to Israel, they couldn't go straight through. They'd been cut off, had they not? But in their buffeting against this land in their travels, they were led into immorality um, by people within Moab and by prophet Balaam, who helped them along the way. Uh, and what happened? Well, there were enough of them involved that God took care of a lot of those people, did he not? Thousands died before they had the chance to step over the river. It's a stark reminder from Numbers 25, 24, of what they did prior to their entry to Canaan. So you see their walk, even in the second generation, was beginning to live out the first generation. 
God had spared the second generation to be able to enter into the, the rest he had promised. But even before he got there, before they got there, there was a bunch of them that had to be cut off. That doesn't mean all of them were cut off, but a great number of them were. I can't get through all of this. Uh, our time will allow it because of all the provocation today. I think we'll stop here. But you're beginning to see as we enter into chapter 10 how Paul is confronting not only the issues they had with him, but confronting their personal issues that led them to have problems with him. They were play acting, as it were and repeating the sins of their forefathers. And it's more than just to the third generation, it's, it's more than personal, it's national. And uh, I think he's pointing that out very clearly. I don't know whether you recognize that the, the five gifts that God gave to redeem to Israel as she came out of Egypt are laid alongside the five despicable sins of their lusting that they provoked him with. Um, the Corinthian church is not far away from doing what Israel was doing in those days. Uh, I just don't think we realize how bad it got in that church. They had been so accustomed to that immoral lifestyle of all types that they did not find any reason to stop that when they took on Christianity. And unfortunately, I feel that too often our churches are full of people who are satisfied with the gospel message. They may or may not be saved. I don't know. Some are just professors. <coughs> I can't tell who. God says he alone knows the heart. But when they begin to practice the immoral sins within the church body, something's really wrong. We don't have a, a strong apostle standing up and saying, boom, 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 on my authority, you're, you're sinning. We have those who are of the smaller A, apostle, our preachers and so on, our leaders, who should be pointing out to individuals one by one if they are stepping over the line so that the things that happen to the Corinthian church don't become our end too. We know many churches this has happened. We didn't just look up the road over the last five years. We don't have to go very far. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Lord, it is uh, a delight to read your word and see how it profits itself and it builds on itself and it explains to us, O oh Lord, the proclivity of the sin nature of man as opposed to the new creation that you gave him and how to separate oneself from those things of the past to buffet the flesh as Paul would liken it to strike himself under the eye so that everybody knows that he's confessing of his own son. Father, it be wise unto us this day to call upon you to give us conviction through the Spirit for those things which are sins that have not been confessed. And to stand on the law of faith that you are faithful to forgive them. Uh, but we, O oh Lord, have to be contrite in our heart enough to know that if we ask for these things, we should never go back to them. And that you have given us power to do that. Uh, those poor people in Israel coming out of the land hadn't risen to the occasion to understand that. Father, we're so thankful for the leading of the Holy Spirit to give us imputed righteousness and then practice righteousness, that we may run a race that when we hit the Bema seat in the future, we shall be indeed in glorious mode and mood to face you face to face 
Oh, Lord, we love you. Pray that you will come soon. We pray your protection over the your elect and uh, in the battlegrounds of both Arab and Israeli this day. Lord, we pray it in Jesus' name.